AJ, um, when you're talking about that unlovable emotion, because I've got that, mm -hmm. and you're saying that we attract people who want to love us because they've got codependent um, addiction, I thought that we attracted people who don't love us. I thought that's my experience a lot of the time. Well, so I'm a bit confused. Yeah, and I'll talk about this with you in more detail because what we do is we initially enter an attraction thinking this person will love us. Does that make sense? And that person enters the attra same attraction thinking they're going to get from you what they're going to get as well. This is why most of our relationships have that initial what we would call honeymoon period. Right? So that's the initial part of the attraction. The initial part of the attraction happens and we're not aware of what's going on generally so the initial part of the attraction happens which is this honeymoon period where we both think yeah this is going to be great for both of us. Right? Ten days later we're now having our doubts because there's all these other things that are hooking into us through these addictions and this is why addictive things never become satisfying in the end. And, and what we need to realise is that actually nothing is going to be satisfying until we deal with this unhealed causal emotion. But we don't believe that because we've been taught differently. And so what we do is we go along trying to get this addiction satisfied. We finish up having the initial honeymoon period of, ah yes, and sometimes the honeymoon period in the spirit world lasts for 50 years or 100 years. It can last a long time until one person changes. And as soon as one person changes, what happens to the other person? If the other person gets angry or upset in any way, then that's telling you, well, we had an addiction going on here. Now some of your addictions are so dependent on each other that you love giving it. And this is the problem, is that many times we love giving the addictive thing in order to get the addiction met. And we can enter very, very strong and powerful addictive relationships through our desires to have the addiction fulfilled. And we can remain in those relationships for many years, thinking they are a happy relationship even. And in reality, all it is is a codependent addiction. And the test of it is when one person begins to change. Does the other person still love? And does the person who's changing still love? For that matter, both of them obviously would still need to have love. And you can leave a relationship but still love the person. Right? And uh, obviously we need to look at that if we can't. So, so, so the initial honeymoon period is usually because of the addictive behaviour and then, then the addictive behaviour attracts a person who also has their own addictions but eventually they become oppressive. The addictive behaviours all become oppressive at some point in the future. And so you end up finishing up fighting about it, you go through a power phase of the relationship where each person is trying to get power over the other and, and then that doesn't work because whenever you're in a power uh, struggle obviously that's not love either. And so eventually what happens is the relationship sort of goes apart and we feel the rejection of it. And the, the, the truth is it needed to be rejected out of our lives, a relationship like that, because it, it was a codependent addiction. But, but we often go down the track ourselves of going, yeah, he was very addictive <laughs> or she was very this or he was very that. Not, not me, not I was, whatever, not I was generating this in some way. And that's where... With our addictions, this is what we do. You think of what happens with a person who's addicted to a substance. Because there are many co like there are many things that are very similar to a person addicted to a substance, of course, as there are addicted to an emotion. Now let's look what happens with a person addicted to a substance. Let's say the substance is alcohol. So what happens initially is they're not an alcoholic, what we would call an alcoholic. They, they, through some, usually some trauma that occurs in their life, sometimes when they're young and sometimes when they're an adult, adult, there's some kind of emotional thing that enters them that they can't, that they feel they will not be able to cope with feeling. And so what they do is they have a drink. So it might be a bit of stress in their life, so they have one drink. And what do you do when you have one drink? That alcohol starts going into your mind and affecting the brain, you get a slightly euphoric feeling. Oh, that feels really nice. Boy, euphoria is a good feeling. I haven't had that for 20 years. Um, another drink wouldn't go astray, right? So you have another drink. And oh, a bit more euphoric feeling uh, going on. Like, so yeah, no, this, feel, this is feeling really good now. Feel a bit spaced out, you know, don't have to worry about my life now. So I've now gotten rid of, 
you know, a lot of the seeming problems of my life have now disappeared because I'm just not conscious of them because I'm in this phase that's manufactured, but I'm feeling this euphoria. So I'm feeling euphoria and then somebody takes away my third drink and says, no, you're not having any more. Uh, what does the average person do under those circumstances? Straight away there is some aggression, isn't it, usually? What do you mean? You're controlling me. You, how dare you do that? I'm all right, I'm fine. Right? Now if you have a person who's in a pattern of addiction to alcohol, you try taking away their bottle. Like they have bottles hidden all over the place, don't they? Just in case somebody comes along and takes away one. Right? Um, who's seen the movie Pay It Forward? You remember at the beginning the lady you know, in this addiction with alcohol and oh, just all sorts of hidden places that the child knew everywhere, <laughs> mum was hiding and stuff. But that's what we do because you take away the thing we're addicted to and generally we go into this place of anger or rage or at least hurt, we at least feel hurt. Now that's because we have the expectation, see that's not how you spell expectation either, <laughs> as you all know probably. Um, you have the expectation that the environment fulfill your unmet emotional addiction. Now the problem with this is, is, is immense when you think about it on the planet. Because it's everything that I believe that I cannot actually feel myself, every single thing that I believe I cannot feel myself, I will expect someone in my environment to fulfill. Now as soon as I expect you to fulfill something that's, an, something that's unmet inside of myself, I am going to have an expectation or requirement placed upon you. And any time I do that, I am being unloving. Even if that requirement is for you to be loving, I'm unloving. Right? Because in the end, we want to get to a stage inside of ourselves where it doesn't matter how any person on this planet, including your partner, your child, your mother, your father, your workmates, colleagues, uh, employer, all of those different people, it doesn't matter to us how any of them treat me, because I'm in a state where I'm going to own my own emotions about everything. I, have, I actually have the power to feel everything inside of myself because remember I said at the beginning, a little three-month-old child has exactly the same power, doesn't it? The little three-month child doesn't have to be educated about how to feel its emotion. Right? So therefore it makes sense that I must somehow inside of me have been designed to be able to feel all of my emotion. Which means I'm able to feel all of my hurts, my causal emotion, my, all the stuff that's inside of me, I am able to feel. I do not need really another person in this planet to fulfill any of those unmet emotions. I don't need that to occur. So when I don't feel it, my environment gets a projection and because everyone in my environment also has very similar damages in different areas, they then project at me whether they're going to fulfil my emotion or not. They're going to stay in this interaction with me or not, depending on their unmet emotional needs and whether I meet theirs. And so every relationship becomes very, very conditional. Every relationship becomes a bartering system. I'm going to talk to them as long as they make me feel this way, make me feel that way, make me feel this way, then they're nice. And if they make me feel bad and they make me feel angry and they make me feel upset and they hurt me, then they're not nice. And we create this separation. All the people who make me feel nice are over in this group. They are the ones who I spend most of my life with. And all the people over in this group, which keep getting attracted to me at some point through my life, I hate their guts and I try to reject them on every possible opportunity. Right? And if that whole group happens to be a nation because I'm a racist <laughs> and they don't meet one of my addictive needs about my race, I'll even do it to the whole nation. And I'll even get out a gun and shoot as many of that nation in order to meet my addiction. That's how powerful these addictions are. They create a world which we're willing to even kill each other to meet 
our addictions. And anyone who doesn't meet my addiction gets destroyed in the process. That's how powerful these addictions are. Now, if I, if I think of it that way, then I can see that it's very important for me to look at dealing with my addictions. Can you see that? It's very important as a part of my spiritual journey to actually get to the point where I'm not intellectually skipping over addiction, when I'm not making out I don't have them, but rather that they actually have gone from within me. Because remember I said to you, whether I'm intellectually conscious or aware that these interactions are happening or not, every unhealed causal emotion inside of me creates the addictive behaviour. This is why people tell you you have a subconscious mind. Right? Because everything you don't want to feel creates your life often. And then they say, oh, it must have been my subconscious mind that created that. No, it's actually something you can be completely conscious about that created that, which is your own feeling inside of yourself from your childhood that you did not want to feel. That's what created it. And if we can see that as, if we want to use the same terminology, that is our unconscious mind, if you like, our subconscious mind, generating a lot of our interactions and generating our law of attraction. 